There's no safety nets here at Peasant. We have the wood-burning grill and we have the wood-burning oven. We do 150 plus covers a night and like that's it. It's either sink or swim. I mean, I think the hardest part, but it's also the most beautiful part, is that you're at the mercy of the fire. You need to figure out how to dance with the fire. Pigs are here. Yeah, so these are our, our pigs from Fossil Farms. Natural, cage-free. I think we got six today. So one of the unique things that we do here is that we offer a whole suckling pig dinner. You have to give us 24 hours in advance. What does she weigh today? 12 and a half. So now I'm gonna put the, the seasoning on it. Um, make our own seasoning with some salt, black pepper, rosemary, garlic, fennel pollen. This is what we use for the rotisserie, as you can see. It has the holes here, and then it links onto the other side. Kind of medieval looking device. So there's no real gentle way to do this. If you're meek at heart, maybe look away. Oh, it's, it's cinched up nice and tight, right up against the skewer, so it's not gonna go anywhere. And then we'll brush it in like a little bit of oil just to kind of really help with the crisping. This is the on and off switch. Nice. That it's pretty unique and special thing to New York City to be able to sit down in a restaurant and have a whole suckling thing. So this is a typical Wednesday morning here at Peasant. Every Wednesday we get quarter wood delivered. Um, they toss it in here. What we'll do is during the day, we'll, we'll get a nice fire going when we first get here. Then start to do our kind of prep and our mise en place. Then we'll have it for the day to kind of dry even to that next level. If you get stuck with, with wet wood during service, there's, right. there's, there's no gas in here. So you can't just like turn it up. All right, so Mike's here today from Widow's Hole. Um, he's bringing a new sample of some smaller oysters. Uh, we use for our wood-fired oysters that come out of the oven. Oysters, fresh, bone marrow on top, blast in the oven until it's crispy on, on the top. A little bit smaller oysters than what, what we usually sell you guys. Yeah, these are great. Yeah. Smaller oysters are actually easier, right? It took me a decade to learn most people like smaller oysters. The ratio between the cup and the length, this is what people like, right? Little deep cup, little oyster, but it's got a nice deep cup here. Okay, chef. Hey man, that's great. Good. The prep team will open probably around 100 of these, and we just lay them out on a sheet pan with foil. We shuck them daily, and then once we shuck the oysters, we'll spoon some of that bone marrow gremolata onto each one, and then put them back in the fridge so it like solidifies on top of the oyster. And then when you guys order a bone marrow roasted oyster, we'll take the six out, pop them in the wood burning oven for about a minute, and the oysters roast. The bone marrow melts and we'll serve them on top and it has to be cooked when you order it. Like you can't do it before. Once you start to get the rhythm of what you can and cannot do, the dishes start to kind of take place. All right, so this is the first step of our rosette, our pasta that comes out of the wood burning oven. The only pasta that doesn't come off the pasta stage. Right now, this is taking our egg yolk dough, which is double oak flour, semolina, and yolks, and rolling it out into basically lasagna sheets. Well, the rosette is a perfect example of things that seem very, very simple when it might come to you. I and mean, we do a lot of this at Peasant, but at the same time, it takes probably two or three days um, and a couple different people uh, to get the job done. And this is the, the first step of cooking the short ribs for the, the rosette. We're gonna sear it in the wood-burning oven. It's pretty hot right now, so we should be able to get a good sear on it pretty quick. Uh, I'm gonna season it with a little bit of salt on top, but we did cure it for two days. They're seasoning all throughout. So it's definitely hot enough to sear. You can tell, like, we should try to gauge it by, if you can hold your hand there for a couple seconds, like, that's pretty hot, so it's ready to sear. That's one of the best things about this oven is that, like, you can see how much smoke is just swirling in there. So you're getting a lot of extra flavor added to it that you just wouldn't normally get by you know, just searing it in a pan, really cooking it any other way. A cast iron will have a good sear too. Anything that's just consistently really hot, but you're not gonna get all the added smoke, just the flavor of cooking with wood. It's really one of a kind. And then we'll turn it once, and then after that it should be ready to go into the, into the brace. I like getting a little bit of char on there, not too much. Like I would say this, this is ready to come out. All right, so we got the sear that we're looking for. It smells great, the color looks good. Got that nice crust. 
Uh, we'll let it sit here, cool off for a second before we bring it downstairs and we'll get the braise on it. So what I love about this braise is that the short rib is really rich. The other ingredients in the braise are super light. So I'm only using garlic, celery, onions, white wine, uh, milk and heavy cream, just a little bit of tomato paste. Yeah, it just has to go for a couple of minutes and then we'll add the, add the wine and reduce. So this is the last step before we put the short ribs in the oven. Once this comes out of the braise, it reduces almost by half. So it actually becomes thick enough after we, we pull the meat. That's what we mix it in. Now that the, the short ribs are in the oven, they'll go in there for about three hours, and then they'll be ready. My chef de cuisine is Greg Thomas. We've been working together on and off, I think, for like six years. Uh, he was at restaurant Mark Foy Joan. He, he's dedicated, he's smart, he's passionate, he's hardworking, and it's been a real treat watching him kind of grow and blossom and, you know, kind of take this restaurant as his own. All right, so these have been in for three hours and they're good to go. I can already tell the sauce is reduced a good amount. It's gonna be the consistency I want it to be. The, the meat started to like pull off the bones, which lets me know that they're super tender and ready to go. The bones will fall right off. Uh, my man Marco over here is gonna pull it. And then we're gonna take the leftover sauce, put it through a food mill, so all the ingredients get ground together. And that's gonna be the sauce that holds the meat together inside the pasta. So now we have our lasagna cheese ready. And the first layer is gonna be our short rib braise. And right now I'm gonna to top it with some brown beech mushrooms. So we're gonna roll it this way. So you're gonna see a nice spiral of pasta and filling. So you get like a silver dollar size. And that spiral on the outside is what's gonna get nice and crispy when it cooks in the, in the oven. So now these are ready. And right before service, we're gonna blanch them. I blanch it so that it, um, it'll set the outside shape. So it like gently cooks the pasta on the outside just enough that'll keep its tight round shape so it won't fall apart after we slice it. It keeps everything nice and whole. So you see we get that nice round shape that we were trying to get before by layering it and rolling it. And then it goes upstairs to the pizza. You know, when I took over Peasant, I was very serious about trying to remind people as they're sitting in the room and looking at the beautiful fire that you can also taste it in as many dishes as possible. So that's why we like to finish the rosette in the wood-burning oven, so you get that kind of char and smoke, and I don't know about you, but the, for me, the best part of lasagna is like that crispy edge, and there's nothing better than a wood-burning oven to give it like that crunch. The reason I wanted to keep it peasant was because I had so much respect for this restaurant and the simplicity of the food and the fire and the smoke and the ambiance. I have uh, three of the guys that are in there that have all been here for multiple years. Olivier uh, on the grill, he's been here since day one, uh, 23, 24 years. Olivier is the master of this whole thing. When, when we first opened, <laughs> I spent from January until COVID, this was my station. I did it on purpose because I wanted to learn, you know, from, from the master himself. The first pig has been on, I would say, give or take three hours, which we're gonna check now and we'll kind of see where we're at. So we're looking for, um, like give or take one, 160, right? 160, 165. Yeah. And we'll check that on the leg because the leg is where you want it the most tender. It looks like we'll be able to take this one off now and, and let the juices settle. You hear that? That's like the pig basically telling you like we're ready to eat. So how many pigs do you think you've cooked in your life? We checked last time, I think it's like two, three thousand, I mean, <laughs> in, in 20 years. Huh? I think so, it's like, five, six a, day, a week. Yeah. And you helped lay down yeah, the yeah, bricks oh, for yeah, all this, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's good work, it's still standing yeah, yeah. 23 years later. Mm -hmm. Now that the pig's ready, it's off the rotisserie. Now we're gonna break it down to smaller pieces for a whole pig dinner. Um, so that can go to the table and it's easy to share and people can grab a nice bite. What we wanna do is try to break down the pig where the joints are so we get nice clean cuts. We don't have to break through bone, we don't have to tear through the flesh. So you can see as he spreads the, the parts before he cuts it, yeah. he's spreading it along the joint. So it's opening up this lane for the knife to go through where it's actually a smooth cut. He's not hacking, he's not sawing, he's not applying any brunt force. You get nice smooth pieces that are kept as whole as possible, just smaller and more manageable to eat. Right now as he separates the ribs from the spine, we're gonna see how we can get really nice clean rib pieces. The ribs are my favorite, it's like, it's crispy, and the meat is very tender, and it has all the flavor of the pork, the, the fat, the meat, 
It's definitely the best part, no matter what. As you guys can tell, there's a lot of stuff going on, not a lot of room. Uh, we got about 15 minutes to push these projects, so everyone get upstairs and be ready for a service. Uh, so this is a strip that we use from the grill, 20 uh, one day age prime strip. And we'll save a, a small portion of it that we'll use for a tartare as well. Okay, so I try to make them uh, 10 ounces, so I make sure, uh, right? And some part they go bigger, so I have to adjust all the time, the, you know, I have to go slowly. So this is tough because as the loin gets wider, um, the amount of ounces it'll be changes drastically. So you have to kind of guess where it's going to be, dial it in with the, the width. Sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. Most of the times, he wins. So it's going to be perfect, I can feel it. They just go a little bigger, but not that much. Wow. Yeah, I ran out of money. No perfect yet. Still got it. So now that we cut our steaks, we're going to separate them into portions we're going to use from the grill. We'll use a bone duster to take the, the bone off the meat and then separate what we're going to save for steak tartare. We're just going to rub it generously with this herby marinade, a bunch of herbs, shallots, pink peppercorns, black peppercorns. And now these are going to be ready to go upstairs. Uh, so we pulled all the meat off of the bones that we, uh, this is just the trim from the strip sticks we cut earlier today. So we're going to cut it nice and small for the tartare. In each portion, we want about 50 grams of, of the actual steak. And we season it like a traditional steak tartare, except we use a little bit of chili for like an Italian kind of spin on it. Uh, I love the combination of flavors, uh, the brightness of the capers, you know, the astringency from the onions. I think it's delicious. But on the steak tartare, we've created this thing that we call a pizza dough pillow. Because I just kind of threw it on top of a steak tartare and as soon as I saw it, like I knew this is where it belongs. She's starting now. You see the bubbles starting to form? This is it. There it is. There's the muddy shot. Boom. This is the peasant steak tartare with the pizza dough pillow. It's like the hot pocket of your dreams. We're just getting ready to go. Everyone's set. Everyone's good to go. And we're going to start getting our, our first wave of tickets pretty soon. Our fire pig. All right, Marco, you got a picante and an octo. Yep. All right, this completes 18, right? Yep. We all have primal beings in us. Cavemen were eating the same way that what we're looking at right now. You know, they were killing animals and putting them on a stick and making a fire and roasting it over the fire. I mean, we're talking, you know, whatever that is, thousands of years ago. Maybe you got a strip of Brussels, of vegetables, and a bread for lobster. I think it awakens this primal energy that we all have. I feel like when you walk through those doors and you just see like this chasm, you know, wood burning, animals roasting, and you smell these smells, and you're literally transported out of New York for the couple hours that you're here.